So <laughs> what's your remedy? You know, when when a court comes along and says, well, we're not going to let you defend your reputation and we're just going to allow these other people to do and say these things about you with impunity. What What's the answer? Yeah, no, I, th I think it goes back to a, a key point that a, a lot of states and their family codes, there are just bad sections in them that don't make any sense that have unintended consequences. So right. you have a state legislator who, who knows, like they're a, they were a small business owner, they were an attorney, they were a teacher, they, they come from all different backgrounds. And it's very, very easy in terms of gaining political points to vote for the most stringent law. I'm sure that this law in the state of Washington was pitched extremely hard as protection for victims of domestic violence was a serious issue. Mm -hmm. But what the legislators didn't see in enacting it was the unintended consequences that will happen because this piece of law is now in place. Right. And they're also ignoring this thing that we are all that we keep talking about, which is the and and which you know Greg Ellis talked about a lot too, which is the dirty little secret of false allegations of of violence and creating artificial high conflict divorce creating these nightmare cluster profanity divorces you that, can say fuck on here <laughs> that that generate this that generate this giant mess that nobody can really sort out you know no one wants to acknowledge that's a truth that actually happens i mean so the washington state domestic the washington state um bench guide for judges so uh the domestic violence bench guide for judges so the so the judges training manual literally says that false allegations of domestic violence are are rare and effectively don't happen and and you've got you've got this entire side of the industry you've got you know people who are posing themselves off like this like um barry goldstein you know an attorney from new york who was suspended because he made false allegations uh in in a case because he made false statements and he was suspended by new york um for five years it's almost it's almost a disbarment and then he reinvents himself as a domestic violence expert and travels around the country and and provides these opinions that you know false allegations don't happen and yet everybody knows it's the dirty little secret that they do and then you get a legislature like the washington state comes along and what they're doing is like well they're going to try and address this piece of the problem without acknowledging that this piece of the problem might actually be generated by that giant elephant in the room that they're not paying attention to yeah, and it's and here's the thing. This this is the thing. Once there once laws end up on the books involving domestic violence, it's going to be nearly impossible to pull them back, at least through the legislature. Right. There, there's just right. there there's no there's only extreme only political suicide to right. come out and sponsor a bill to say we don't want to be tough on domestic violence. Right. Who wants so to come only, out? Who wants to come out and say people lie about domestic violence because they want to yeah. get revenge against their ex? <laughs> what, Not a is, politician. Right. What politician wants to do that? What, what politician wants to say, let's draft a bill to, uh, to deal with the, the person who makes false allegations of domestic violence and ruins their ruins their you know, their ex's lives let's let's draft a bill to address that problem let's make sure you know let's let's make that a crime let's 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 lock those people up what that's not going to happen right because prosecutors offices so in, in my case my my ex-wife filed filed enough false police reports that the police actually got in, 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 interested and they 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 submitted a case a, against her for false police reports and it went to the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor's office declined charges. And and the the reality of the reason why the prosecutor's office declined charges is because 
they don't want to charge someone who's clearly committing the crime of filing false police reports, trying to frame their ex-husbands for violations they didn't do because they don't want to discourage other domestic violence victims from coming forward and reporting violations. I'm like, wait, what? We're not even talking about that. We're talking about people who actually commit the crime of filing a false police report. But the political reality is, if you if you do the modern equivalent of crying wolf and saying domestic violence, the authorities treat you radically differently, and they and they don't want to hold you responsible. Yeah, and I think for, on the political landscape, and we spend a lot of time on this show talking about that. It, we live in a a proverbial Twitter world when there right. needs to be the nuance of a book. Um, and not the 280 characters that everything must boil down to. So, I mean, is domestic violence a serious issue? Yes, and it's extremely serious when it occurs. Uh And both men and women are victims Mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And we need laws to reflect that these Mm -hmm. situations need to, Mm -hmm. number one is our constitutional rights need to be Mm -hmm. protected. Mm -hmm. And number two is we need laws on the books that Mm -hmm. deal with the nuance of each situation. Sure, you're absolutely right. Domestic, I mean, so, and and Greg Ellis goes into this in his book and the respondent, you know, and yeah, absolutely. I I mean, I think everyone agrees domestic violence is a real issue and, and, and it needs to be addressed. But, you know, the U.S. Census Department and the DOJ, you know, the data from them shows that domestic violence has done nothing but fall since the 1980s or so. But meanwhile, during that time, so actual domestic violence has fallen in that time period. But meanwhile, the definition of what constitutes domestic violence has expanded to take in a whole range of otherwise fairly normative behaviors. Jenny Souk, a professor of law at Harvard Law, says that domestic violence is defined so broadly now that you can make the argument that it exists in almost every household. Yelling at, yelling at your spouse can be domestic violence. Getting frustrated and, and slamming a dish down on, on, uh, on, on the table or on the floor and having it break can be domestic violence, right? That it, in that world, they, they warp the thinking of, the, of their client into believing that they might be a, a victim of domestic violence when they're not. And <laughs> so, yeah, domestic violence is an actual issue. It absolutely is an actual issue and it needs to be addressed. Right. But the people who are out there making false allegations of domestic violence in order to in order to achieve an advantage, not only are they victimizing their child, not only are they victimizing their ex, but they're victimizing the person who needs those services and isn't going to get them or or. Right. Or or even so, even so, they're, they're victimizing society on a sociological level as well, because people who would otherwise otherwise be receptive and sympathetic to a person who says they're a victim of domestic violence is going to be far less receptive to that. Now, I personally, when someone says to me I was a victim of domestic violence because of my experience in this world and being falsely accused of all of this stuff, I think to myself when I go, you know what? I don't believe you unless you can show me some real evidence. Right? I, I think that uh, I, I would feel very much the same way uh, seen day in, day out. I would say that 75 to 80 percent of my clients have either been accused of domestic violence mm-hmm. or have a domestic violence restraining order out against them. Mm-hmm. And I, I could honestly say I, I, I don't believe any of them had ever touch their spouse or threaten them in any, any meaningful way. The majority of them are bickering back and forth um, or saying something happened. Um, few of them, they called the police and then, then, then it turns around two years later and the ex claims, Oh, well the police were called, but he called the police because you were an issue. Oh no, no, no. But he was actually the problem. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, and and we have this preponderance of the evidence where I think you said it very well earlier. We have, if a judge gets it wrong, we have their name ends up in the paper yep. in a domestic violence situation. If yep. they grant it and it's wrong, mm-hmm. not the only one, only party that's harmed in that is the one they granted it against and their child. 
and the courts don't want to acknowledge the damage they do to the child in that situation. Right, and they don't want to. Also, they don't want to acknowledge the damage that they're doing to the parents too. And the problem, you know, the thing is, is they they always think about, oh well, what if I get this wrong? And she needed this order to protect her, and this order would have caused her to live. Um, and you know, she wouldn't. But they don't pay. A, 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 they don't pay. And and does that happen? Yes. Is it is it a huge problem? Meaning that it's it's got a lot of numbers behind it? No. And if you look at the numbers of, of the opposite side of that problem, so here in Washington State, about a year ago, we had a psychologist in Bellingham, which is the large city to the north, um, a mom who uh, you know was going through one of these high conflict divorces that was that appears to be I'm not positive about this appears to have been largely fueled by um, um, uh, an attorney involved. Um, and she lost custody. She was going to have 50-50 custody. And she lost it, and she killed herself, and she killed her kids. Uh, there's a case in Bellevue of um, of a man who a year and a half ago, just before COVID, he had been saying to everybody, look, I think my ex-wife is unstable. He'd been telling the courts, opposing counsel, the GAL, the police, saying, I think she's unstable, right? Meanwhile, they got this. They got these, these attorneys going at it, creating this giant mess, Right, making everything worse, constantly escalating problems, not de-escalating problems, and he's looking at it going. I think she's unstable. He he wins. He wins a, a custody motion. He's going to get. I don't remember if he's going to get 50-50 custody. He was going to get something, but he wins some custody motion. She hires young boys as hitmen. They go and they shoot this guy nine times. He lives, and he turns around. The first thing he does is he says to the police, "He says it wasn't the kids. It was my ex-wife." Right, John Mast last year. You know, do you know? But you know about the John Mast case, right? The yep. John Mast horrible custody fight, fueled by both mental health issues by his ex-wife, and probably got a hell of a lot worse because of the conflict creation inside of their divorce. Right, horrible nightmare, never-ending divorce. Allegations goes on for years. He's finally cleared of everything. He's gonna go see and get his get his kids for her first visit in years, and instead of you know finding his kids, his father in law, ex father in law shows up. So the grandfather of his children, right, and pulls out a gun and puts several bullets into him, and he dies on the scene. You know, so you know, does it happen that judges, you know, might not issue a domestic, might not issue an ex parte restraining order that that you know, could result in a horrible tragedy. Absolutely that happens and that's a concern, right? But the other side of that problem also happens as well, where you come along and you create this giant clusterfuck divorce, you know, nothing but confusion. You never calm it down. You do nothing but pour fire on it, right? And the problems happen from that. And, and, that's, and that's unique. You know, there are studies after studies after studies in all, lots of places that show there are other ways to go about doing that. There was a Dutch study that found that even when you take when you take parents that are very hostile to each other and you force them to work with each other and you give them a 50-50 custody agreement, that within, within a few years, things have normalized and there is almost no problems between the parents and the kids have done better because there's nothing to fight about. And that's the exact opposite of American thinking on that. American thinking is, is that if the parents don't get along, then what we're going to do is we're going to create a we're going to create a situation in which we're going to favor one parent over the other. And all that does is perpetuate the conflict forever. And so and it rewards the it rewards the parent who wants to say, screw you, I don't want to do anything with you. I don't want to cooperate with you. I don't want to co-parent with you. I'm just going to be obstructionary and eventually the court's going to give me what I want. That's completely insane. Yeah, no, and I mean we're starting in here in the United States. I think uh, states are going to have a lot more trouble pushing back against 50-50 parenting as these statistics out of Kentucky keep coming out. Domestic violence down, uh, number of court hearings down, the number of settlements up, um, and then just the the studies, the soft science studies that literally every single party that's involved when you you put an equal and shared parenting plan in place improves 
The mother presuming they don't get buried. Presuming they don't get buried. I mean, if you if you take a look at what's happening between um, uh, uh, Jennifer Harmon and the people who are just trying to discredit her, right? So the, the entire domestic violence industry is trying to turn on her and stick knives in her back and say that that her research is not good research. And it's 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 a continuation of the same argument that parental alienation is junk science, that it's that the father's rights movement is misogynist, that all we are is angry dads pissed off because we didn't do well in the divorce. It's a continuation of that that entire line of thinking where they're going to discredit anybody who comes forward and says, "Well, no, here's what's going on," right? You know, um, there's there's no truth to this idea that that um, uh, uh, abusive uh, abusive fathers are gaining control of their children by falsely alleging parental alienation. That's one of the studies that's come out from from um, from Dr. Harmon. Dr. Harmon coming along and saying parental alienation is actual. It's real. It's a form of domestic violence against against the other parent. It's a form of child abuse of the child, and she's got hard social science for it. And what does she get? She gets attacked by the domestic violence industry that's trying to do that. But, you know, on the other side of the equation, that means that we have to stand up for these people, right? We have to come out. We have to say, no, that's not, that's not appropriate, you know, just like we've got to stand up to the unethical attorneys, you know, like, you know, and say, no, you know, your tactics, your behavior don't belong in our profession.